All right, so let's start with the first poison, chocolate. Now, we see a ton of chocolate poisoning in the ER. And I'm gonna say, I typically treat most chocolate poisonings outpatient. I'm pretty aggressive about treating chocolate with decontamination. And that's because when dogs eat chocolate, and cats rarely ever look at this toxicant, but when they eat it, they eat huge amounts. But most of the time, most American holidays are associated with chocolate. Easter, Halloween, Christmas, right? So it's our favorite time of our year. It's my favorite time because it's the one time chocolate vomit smells good. <laughs> so really, really fun to induce vomiting with chocolate toxicity. Um, the other key thing to keep in mind is that most chocolate out there, unless it's like Baker's chocolate or semi-sweet chocolate or like the 90% cocoa, uh, honestly, it's not gonna be a big deal. Halloween time. When you actually look at the amount of true theobromine in a Milky Way, like one of the baby size ones, it's not going to be a huge, huge deal. But this is the one poison that owners really know about. So there is actually a toxic dose, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. The hard thing is you can calculate it out, but what we can't calculate out is the amount of theobromine that we get back on emesis, right? So we have to ballpark it. My general rule is more than 20 mg per kg of theobromine is going to result in GI signs, chocolate vomit, chocolate diarrhea. 40 mg per kg can result in cardiotoxic signs, so they're tachycardic, they're hypertensive. 60 mg per kg can result in seizures and neurologic signs, and honestly, I've knock on wood, never had a chocolate case die. I had one case where the owner elected not to bring his dog in until 18 hours later, when he ate a whole 12 ounce container of semi-sweet baking chocolate. And it was a pug, it was brachiocephalic. He didn't bring him in until the dog was regurging chocolate out of his nose. So we ended up euthanizing that one. But in general, chocolate toxicity has an awesome prognosis. So again, 20, 40, 60, mixed for keg is when I start to care. Now, clinical signs can typically last somewhat long. The half-life of chocolate in a dog is about 17 hours. And my general rule is treat based on what the clinical signs are gonna be. Dog comes in, he ate chocolate three hours ago. If his heart rate is already 200, it is too late to induce emesis. So if you learn one thing from this lecture, please do not induce emesis in symptomatic patients. If it's a crazy labradoodle, his heart rate's 160, 170, he's bouncing off the walls, but he always bounces off the walls, sure, I'll still induce emesis. But if they're really, really symptomatic, please don't induce emesis. We know we've all hospitalized these patients that look like this. They ate chocolate 12 hours ago. What do they do after we admit them into the hospital? They vomit up more chocolate. So I'm gonna say chocolate stays in the stomach for a pretty long period of time. Dog comes in, it's been six hours since it ate it. Its heart rate's 170. I'm still okay inducing emesis in that scenario, but if they're really, really symptomatic, again, we don't want to induce emesis. And I typically will hospitalize these guys until their clinical signs go, go away. So typically 12, 24 hours. Now, you're welcome um, to download this information. You can actually, if you download the ASPCA Animal Poison Control Center app, it's totally free. There's a chocolate calculator and a bromethylene calculator in there. And so, again, if you look at the type of chocolate, that's going to um, affect how we de decontaminate the patient. I don't like white chocolate. If you're going to give me a gift, I only want dark chocolate. When you look at white chocolate, it only has 0.25 mg per ounce. A Labrador has to eat over 100 pounds of white chocolate to get theobromine poisoning, right? Which is why it doesn't taste good. So, in that scenario, sure, that dog will probably get sick from all the butter and the sugar, but it would only take that same 30 kg dog to develop chocolate poisoning with Baker's chocolate, a couple of ounces, okay? So again, look at the type of chocolate to be an issue. Now, I'm gonna talk about caffeine a little bit later. Don't bother calculating the amount of caffeine in chocolate. It's not a big deal, okay? I'm gonna talk about pure caffeine. Like if you've ever taken no-dose to stay awake to study, that can be deadly, okay? But that small amount of caffeine and chocolate is not gonna be a big deal at all. So clinically, what are we gonna see? And what are we gonna do? When do we make that decision to hospitalize that patient? Well, again, it's gonna be based on the time since ingestion. 
When did he eat it? If it was recent ingestion, I still have time to decontaminate. I still feel like I'm going to get a good yield. Absolutely decontaminate them. If they vomit up a significant amount of chocolate, it's going to affect my decision on whether or not I'm going to hospitalize that patient or not. Always offer highest standard of care. You're not sure, you can always offer to hospitalize them for a few hours, half a day, a day, put them on IV fluids, put them on an anti-medic, give them a few doses of charcoal, sedate them if needed, and then ultimately send them home once their clinical signs have resolved. Clue number two. So your first thing you should have learned is don't induce emesis in symptomatic patients. Second takeaway from this lecture is if you have a tachycardic, agitated, hypertensive, poison patient, I want you to give more ACE promising. okay? As a criticalist, I don't use a lot of ACE because most of my patients are hypotensive, they're post-op, they're sedate. In the poison patient, the answer is ACE, ACE, and more ACE, okay? So again, if they're hypertensive, tachycardic, agitated, bouncing off the walls, cat or dog, they're a poison patient, they need more ACE promising. Okay, so sedate them. I will say I don't exceed the plums dose. I usually start at a weenie dose 0.01 to 0.05 mg per gig of ACE. I do not exceed plums dose. I don't use more than three mg total ever in a big dog. They get really, really hypotensive. But we do have some chocolate cases that are really tachycardic. Heart rate's 180, 190. They're bouncing off the walls. Ace, ace, and more ace. All right, so how are we going to treat these guys? You guys feel comfortable with this, but... Emesis induction, even a couple of hours out, as long as they're not too symptomatic because that chocolate stays in the stomach for a long time. Multiple doses of charcoal. Please keep in mind one of the mistakes I see people making is they'll give apomorphine, induce emesis, and then an hour later give charcoal. Please don't wait. Give it immediately. The longer it takes you to give charcoal, the less effective it is. Of course, they're going to be nauseous, and nothing is more heartbreaking to your staff than when a dog vomits up charcoal. That took them a long time to get in. So please give one dose of moropitin. As soon as they're done, dry heaving. You induce emesis with apomorphine or hydrogen peroxide or whatever you're using. They vomit, vomit, vomit. Once you feel like their stomach's evacuated, I'm gonna immediately give one IV dose of moropitin. Then I immediately start with toxaban or whatever type of activated charcoal. I like to give two to maybe three doses at most um, I typically will use one to two grams per kg orally every six hours for a couple of doses. Okay. Um, next thing, supportive care. IV fluid therapy, hydrate them, uh, treat any ongoing losses to prevent that rare, rare, rare side effect of hypernatremia from getting multiple doses of charcoal. If they're agitated, tachycardic, and hypertensive, ACE, ACE, and more ACE. If they're seizuring, which knock on wood, I've never had a chocolate case be that bad, whatever type of anticonvulsant you have, IV diazepam, IV Keppra, IV phenobarbital. And I'm gonna say the biggest takeaway with chocolate poisoning is what kills them is that tachycardia. We do not tolerate a sustained tachycardia in a dog more than 180 beats per minute. Why? That's when we treat shock. That is how some schools will actually put a temporary pacemaker into dog models to create their DCM model. They just pace them at 180 beats per minute for a couple of days and they get DCM. That's why you treat tachycardia. It utilizes a huge amount of myocardial oxygen. Your ventricles are beating so fast they don't have time to relax and fill with blood to eject that blood. So if the heart rate's 180, persistently 180, you treat it. Ace, 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 still tachycardic, they need something that's going to slow down the heart rate, something like a beta blocker, okay? You have one heart, two lungs, beta one, you're going to block beta one and slow that heart rate down with a beta blocker like propanolol, okay? Do I put every single chocolate poisoning on an ECG? No. But I'm probably going to TPR them every couple of hours. I'm going to check on them to make sure their heart rate's okay. If I give them ACE, ACE, and ACE, I'm going to check a blood pressure on them every couple of hours. And once their clinical signs resolve, totally fine to go home. So again, uh, prognosis is excellent, but we're gonna base it on that 20, 40, 60 mg per kg theobromine dose. And remember, your clinical signs are gonna be GI toxicity at 20 mg per kg, 40 mg per kg is gonna be cardiotoxic, 
60 mg per kg is going to be neurotoxic. So ultimately, excellent prognosis with chocolate poisoning.